Welcome to today's uh, radiology case discussion uh, session. So as uh, we have been doing these radiology sessions every Friday uh, since uh, almost about two months. So how this works is that I will share uh, a few cases uh, either on PACS or on PowerPoint, and then um, you guys can type in your uh, answers in the chat section. If you're new here, my name is Amar Adare. I'm a radiologist currently working at McMaster University Canada and doing a fellowship here. And without any further ado, I should start sharing, your sharing the cases. Today, uh, I'll be sharing three cases. Uh, so these are PACS-based cases uh, uh, to simulate real life. Uh, uh, so similar to what you would see in your routine radiology practice. And then you can let me know your thoughts. And once we are done with viewing the images, we can go over and talk a little bit about that. After my discussion, we have uh, a special guest today and he'll be sharing five cases as well. So let's start with the first case. If, I, if there are any issues with my audio, please let me know in the chat session. And in the chat, we are joined by uh, Dr. Amaya Kulkarni. He's a staff at McMaster University, and he'll be helping us uh, uh, with our uh, chat session. We see that uh, we have viewers from Romania, Canada, uh, Nigeria, so uh, technically from uh, all over the world. So thank you for taking out time for this uh, session today. And uh, I shall start sharing the first case. Okay, so this is our first case. This is a frontal radiograph of the knee. This patient had a trauma. So let me know if you have any thoughts based on the radiograph. So this is the frontal view. I'll just pull up the uh, lateral view as well here. Yeah, just the window a bit. Okay, so patient with trauma. So do you see anything in these radiographs? Okay, medial collateral calcification. Uh, not really, maybe uh, it's projectional. So if you get this radiograph uh, while you're reporting, what would you do uh, and what would you suggest? Okay, fracture of lateral tibial condyle, C-gone fracture, Selda says it's a lateral tibial fracture, linear calcific density adjacent into the lateral condyle. I'm having trouble visualizing that, but the finding that I saw in this case was, uh, okay, let me get this. So lateral femoral condyle fracture, I don't uh, like it. I'm sure it must be projectional. I don't see a lateral condyle fracture. The one thing which uh, uh, I think nobody has mentioned uh, and is important is that this patient has a suprapatellar effusion. Uh, in a patient with trauma and with suprapatellar effusion, we should start thinking about fractures and start looking for them actively. So does anybody uh, see a fracture here? Just trying to get my pointer here. Okay, so there is a subtle depression involving the lateral tibia. So if you see this depression, so there is a subtle depression involving the lateral tibial plateau. Uh, it's difficult to diagnose on this. So even if you uh, do not pick this up, uh, that's fine. But at least whenever you see a patient uh, with trauma and there is a uh, effusion, make sure that you suggest, uh, uh, suggest uh, 
a C follow-up CT just to rule out an underlying fracture. In this case, there is definite depression involving the lateral tibial condi lateral tibial plateau. Uh, and uh, on the lateral view, you see this suprapatellar effusion here. So uh, we did suggest a CT and I'll show you the CT. So remember that the lateral condyle is usually flat or either or it be concave, uh, whereas the medial condyle, medial condyle is convex and the lateral is usually flat. So I meant to say flat. So whenever you see a depression along the lateral tibial condyle, make sure uh, in a patient with trauma, make sure that you suggest CT. So this was the CT for the patient. So these are the coronal uh, CT images for this patient. And uh, hopefully this makes it clear now. So we definitely see a uh, fracture involving the lateral tibial plateau with some amount of depression and it extends uh, to the tibial spine. So does anybody know what fracture classification is important uh, in cases of tibial plateau fractures? What is the fracture classification that you're supposed to report? Let's me pull up the action here. So the lipohemarthrosis was not really well appreciated on the radiograph, but here you definitely see uh, fat and blood interface. So this has also been described as the FBI sign uh, because of the fat and blood interface. So, okay, so this is uh, hemarthrosis and this is uh, fat in the knee joint, which gives rise to this FBI sign. So fat, uh, fat and blood interface is known as the FBI sign. So excellent, uh, Olga, Selda, uh, Rajan, S Sahiti, uh, Mitch, uh, Avni and Suman. So Schatzker classification is important whenever you're reporting tibial fractures. And uh, depending on which part of the tibia is involved, the tibial plateau is involved, uh, we can classify these fractures. And uh, I'll discuss these in detail uh, 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 once I go to the PowerPoint. So this case, remember, was a Schatzker type 2 uh, fracture. And with Schatzker, the higher the uh, the fracture type, uh, the worse the prognosis and the more severe the injury. So one, two, three are usually low energy injuries, while fractures from four to six are associated with higher energy injuries. So that was my first case. So a Schatzker type two classification, uh, type two fracture. And the teaching point is that if you see uh, effusion or hemarthrosis on a uh, radiograph and you don't see a fracture, uh, make sure that you suggest uh, ACT for these patients. Okay, so let's move on to the next case. Okay, so this next case, uh, so this patient, uh, this patient initially came uh, for an ultrasound with a history of hematuria. I'll share the ultrasound images. Hopefully you're able to view those. Okay, so this these were the ultrasound images. So a say elderly patient presenting with hematuria these are the ultrasound images. Does anybody see anything uh, in this ultrasound? So we have an actual ultrasound image with color at the level of the bladder. Okay, so Subhan, you're right. This is a jet of urine. And there is a structure here, which uh, shouldn't be here. So as uh, Avdut and uh, Meghna, Minu, 
and uh, Debashis have rightly pointed out that is a uh, say a hyperechoic uh, linear area and there is uh, an anechoic area behind it. So definitely in this, uh, we should have suspected a urotracele uh, on the ultrasound. However, this was not very clear. So this patient uh, ended up having a CT urogram and I'll go over the images for that. So whenever you're seeing a CT urogram, there are a couple of tips that I would like to share. So uh, in patients with hematuria, cystoscopy is the gold standard. If there is a urinary bladder tumor, they are able to see it on cystoscopy, even of the smallest of tumors. They will not send you these patients to look for bladder tumors. The reason that you are uh, these patients undergo urograms is to rule out cancers, synchronous cancers involving the urinary tract and the, the ureters and the collecting systems. So uh, pay attention to the ureters and urinary, uh, the, the pelvic system, the bladder tumor they are aware of and they're better, uh, in fact, they see it better on ureteroscopy. So the other uh, common mistake that I've seen people do is, uh, so the CT urogram you'll view uh, in the images that the technicians provide you. Like, so if you view uh, CT urogram in this window, uh, you'll miss a lot of uh, subtle tumors. So make sure whenever you're, uh, whenever you're looking at a CT urogram, you uh, either use a bone window or adjust uh, the window to close to bone window settings. So when you widen the window like this, Okay, let me show you. Let me try this. Okay, so when now you see the difference. When you widen the window close to bone window, you're able to appreciate uh, the colitial system and subtle filling defects you'll be able to pick up on these. So make sure that you use bone window settings for your CT urogram. So at the same time, I'll show you in contrast, if you see these coronal MIPS, if you do not use bone windows, you can easily miss subtle lesions. Uh, okay, so the other uh, tip is always make sure that your technician uh, pick, uh, for, makes these MIP images because they are useful for picking, picking up subtle findings and they give a uh, CTIVU kind of picture, which the surgeons like. So let's go over the uh, each collision system. So I don't see any filling defect here. Uh, the, the colysis are fine. Sometimes you can get blunting of colysis uh, and uh, you can get renal papillary necrosis. All of these are not very common uh, for uh, common, uh, uh, but if you have patients who are on long-term analgesics, that's where uh, you should be thinking of renal papillary necrosis as a cause of hematuria. So, so far, I do not see any filling defects uh, on the CT urogram. So the right one is fine. Let come, let's come to here. So here is where the abnormality is. And as all of you rightly picked it up on the ultrasound image, there is a focal dilatation of the terminal left ureter. Uh, so this is a ureterocele. And we saw uretric jet on the ultrasound, uh, which is always important to document, especially if you're doing your own ultrasounds. Documentation of uretric jets confirms that there is no obstructing lesion. So even if there is a calculus, it would be either partially obstructing or a non-obstructive. Interestingly, I don't know if you're able to appreciate, luckily for this CT urogram, we picked up uh, uh, the ureteric jet even on the, uh, even on the CT. So this ureterocele is kind of blowing its own trumpet. So this was a case, uh, uh, an incidental ureterocele. And in fact, on cystoscopy, uh, this patient uh, was described to have a submucosal lesion. So uh, a, a ureterocele was confused with a submucosal lesion and glad that they didn't do biopsy right away. And uh, they suggested a CT because a biopsy would have been uh, traumatic. Uh, so that was my second case. Let's move on to my last case. In the meanwhile, uh, what is this appearance on CT IVU or say conventional IVU of ureterocele known as? So, uh, so this has been, uh, this has similarity with something and then somebody came up with an interesting name for this. So what is the CT IVP or IVP appearance of a ureterocele? So as uh, Amaya has uh, rightly pointed out, make sure that you uh, remember Weigert mir law, because uh, in exams, if you get a case of ureterocele or any 
anomaly of the generator urinary, uh, say the collecting system, uh, uh, you will definitely be asked about the vega mayert law. So make sure that you are thorough with the vega mayert law. Excellent. So all of you have rightly pointed out, it is the adder head or cobra head appearance. So adder is another word for cobra. So that's uh, uh, the appearance of urethrocele. So a dilated urethrocele and uh, uh, will appear as a bulbous uh, 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 portion of the lower ureter and its walls surrounding it will be uh, will be uh, will be seen as a filling defect ahead of it. So that's what gives rise to the adder head appearance in case of um, urethrocele or also known as cobra head appearance. Moving on to my last case. So this patient uh, had a non-specific abdominal pain and uh, I'll show you the CT images. I also have the MR images. So we'll go with the CT images and uh, followed by the MR images. So Suman, uh, I do not think that there was any twinkling on the uh, uh, ultrasound because that would have suggested a calculus. Let me just check uh, if there was any. So maybe there is some twinkling here, but twinkling, remember, you can get whenever there is uh, rapid flow. So anything that causes uh, loss of the normal low uh, flow that can give rise to turbulence and that can also give rise to uh, say kind of a twinkling artifact, but we would call it aliasing in that case and not a twinkling artifact. So in this case, if you increase the frequency, this artifact will go. But in twinkling, the frequencies are quite higher. So uh, whenever uh, you're confused, whether it's aliasing or twinkling, make sure that you increase your frequency and see if it stays or goes. So you're correct that you did pick up a very subtle area of uh, uh, twinkling, but that's more of an aliasing artifact. Okay, this patient also had ultrasound. So let me share the ultrasound images for uh, this patient. So I have uh, a single ultrasound image. Uh, we see multiple hyperechoic areas throughout the liver and uh, uh, there's barely any uh, normal appearing parenchyma in this patient. So the largest one we measured was up to 2.3 centimeter. This patient presented with non-specific abdominal pain. So this appearance on ultrasound, we'll be starting to think of, uh, say, hemangiomas. But multiple hemangiomas, they are very rare. Like, I've not seen a patient with these many hemangiomas. The other thought is adenomas. Sometimes they can have a hyperechoic appearance, so, ad so multiple adenomas. That's also a good thought. Metastasis uh, is the one which uh, we should be worried about uh, because uh, multiple lesions, hyperechoic appearance can uh, be seen in uh, multiple mets. However, this patient did not have any malignancy. Uh, nonetheless, we did uh, think that this patient should go ahead with CT. So Saini, you correctly pointed out that this could be, these could be mets, uh, although the typical appearance for mets would be uh, a targetoid appearance. Uh, this can also be seen with MET. So those were our thoughts. Uh, and then we suggested a CT. So this is the CT of the patient. Hamartomas is a good thought, but again, on ultrasound hamartomas, we don't see them really well. So uh, they're, com they, 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 they're commonly diagnosed on um, CT, or, uh, CT or MR as multiple fluid density or intensity lesions throughout the liver parenchyma. But with multiple lesions, that's definitely a thought, although the ultrasound appearance would not be uh, similar to that. Okay, so let's see if you can pick up the finding here. So there is a simple cyst here. We are going to ignore that. Okay, let me adjust the window a bit maybe. So similar to what we saw on ultrasound, there are multiple ill-defined hypoechoic, hypo-dense uh, lesions throughout the liver parenchyma. There is a clue towards the diagnosis in this case. Uh, I will share that and uh, let's see if anybody is able to pick that up. So hemangioendothelioma, that's also a good uh, uh, thought, but usually they are larger and on CT, they should be more well-defined. So these lesions, in fact, they may be very difficult to pick up uh, on your, uh, say, if you're viewing on a mobile screen, they might be difficult to pick up those. Let's zoom it a bit. Okay, so there is an important finding at the porta. So let, I'll freeze the image here and uh, let me know if you see any vascular discrepancy. 
focal fat, Mitch, that's a very good thought because uh, focal fat uh, can have a nodular appearance. Uh, and I have seen cases where there are multiple foci of focal fat. Uh, uh, so that's a very good thought. So does anybody see any vascular anomaly at the porta? Cavernous transformation is a good thought, but I, so this portal vein, I can see it uh, throughout its entire length. So I would not uh, think about portal uh, cavernoma in this case. So this is the hepatic artery. Do, does anybody see anything abnormal about the hepatic artery? Okay, varices. Uh, I do not, again, I do not see uh, a, a lot of varices here. The, the, the finding that I'm trying to uh, discuss is that, uh, uh, so partial gastric resection, Amaya, you've correctly pointed out. Uh, so Suman, exactly. So that's what I'm trying to get to. The hepatic vein is quite enlarged. Uh, so it's almost as uh, enlarged as the portal vein. So Zelda, excellent. So whenever you see an enlarged hepatic artery, start thinking about AP shunts. So AP shunts uh, uh, can be seen in various disorders. Uh, uh, there is one disorder which is uh, typical for AV shunts, uh, AP, uh, arterial portal shunts, and that can have uh, say hypervascular or hypovascular lesions. So let's see if anybody can get that. So good that you were able to pick up that finding. So a dilated portal, uh, dilated hepat, uh, hepatic artery, uh, you start thinking of AV shunts. The another uh, thing that we should be noticing is that, uh, uh, not in this case, but when I'll show you the MR, okay, let's move on to the MR. Uh, okay, I will arrange this. And then uh, let's look at the MR for this patient. So this is the arterial phase image. Let me pull up another, say, a portal venous phase. Okay, let's put it here. This one can go here. And this, so this is the first one. Uh, the first image on the left is the arterial phase image. The second image is a portal venous phase image. And the third one is a slightly delayed image. So I go over these so that you can be able to see these. And uh, so on arterial phase, you see this striking finding, like you see this multiple hypervascular lesions throughout the liver. And uh, another important vascular finding in this case that, you sh that should uh, strike you is that the hepatic veins are already filling up in the arterial phase, which should never be the case. Even the portal vein is quite, like it's dilated, it's filled up and uh, the other veins are not as uh, filled up as the hepatic circulation. So multiple arterially enhancing lesions with early opacification of hepatic veins. So that again uh, pushes us towards a diagnosis of say a vascular shunt of some kind. Again, the portal vein and hepatic vein are almost of similar caliber. Moving on to the portal venous phase. So you can barely see any of these lesions. So where did they go? So in the portal venous phase and even in the delayed phase, we are not able to see any of the lesions. Okay, so as Selda has rightly pointed out, uh, even before I showed the MR images, uh, this is a case of hereditary hemorrhagic telangiectasias in a patient. Uh, uh, so these are multiple uh, telangiectasias and uh, arteriovenous uh, uh, perfusion anomalies in a patient with hemorrhagic, uh, hereditary hemorrhagic telangiectasia, which is also known as osler weber rendu syndrome. So these are usually asymptomatic, like uh, the, the pulmonary uh, and even the hepatic. Hepatic findings are mostly seen, um, say, incidentally. These do not cause any uh, issue to the patient apart from congestive, uh, say, a high output cardiac failure if, you're, if they are numerous in number but uh, otherwise they're usually uh, uh, incidentally detected. So Mitch also correctly pointed out that uh, this was osler weber rainbow syndrome. Okay, so we'll discuss a few important points regarding the cases that we uh, discussed. And then we'll move on to our second speaker. Okay, so this is the Schatzker classification of uh, tibial plateau fractures. Uh, thanks to Dr. Disha Lokanwala, who's one of our uh, newest uh, uh, 
uh, core team YAN member who has contributed this illustration. I've written an article in detail on uh, tibial plateau fractures and their implications. Uh, I will leave a link to that in the description. We'll go over the uh, classification in brief. Remember, uh, I told you, higher the number, worse the prognosis and higher, uh, higher the trauma that causes these fractures. So this, so type one is a uh, simple fracture that uh, goes across uh, uh, the lateral tibial, uh, lateral tibial plateau, so a wedge fracture. If there is depression more than five millimeter, it is classified as a type two fracture. When there is an set, when there is a depression, when there's only a depression, that is a type three fracture. Again, that's divided into A and B depending on where the depression is. Uh, a type four fracture is a split fracture involving the medial plateau. Type five and type six fractures are the uh, ones with worse prognosis and they are commonly associated with soft tissue injuries, uh, including vascular injuries. So make sure that in these cases, you look at the popliteal veins and you look at the tibial, uh, look at the peroneal nerves because they are commonly injured in type five and type six fractures. Each of this, for each of these fractures, the management is slightly different. Again, um, instead of going uh, over it uh, during the talk, I leave a link to the article that I've written and then you can go over that. So that is, Schatzker classification. You do not need to remember it, uh, uh, the entire classification, but just remember that there is a classification like this. And then uh, always, like whenever you get a tibial plateau uh, fracture case, make sure that you look it up on the internet and uh, uh, give the diagnosis appropriately. Moving on to the second case that I shared, this is uh, what I was talking about, the cobra head or adder head appearance. So urethroceal, as we all know, is a dilatation of the terminal uh, ureters. There are two types of urethroceals. The first type is a simple urethroceal, uh, which is the more common one, uh, which, in which the, ure uh, the, the, the attachment of the ureter is orthotopic. So whenever you hear the word ortho, so start thinking about uh, similar. So, so orthotopic means similar to what you would see in normal cases. So a simple urethroceal is the one where the ureter opens at, a, uh, at its normal expected location. Now, uh, what happens, just let me get my pointer here. Okay, so uh, the, the, the cause for urethroceal is usually uh, some form of obstruction at the distal end of ureter, and uh, that causes ballooning of its uh, lower end. Uh, in cases of simple urethroceals, in younger patients, the obstruction can be congenital, and uh, a pathophysiology that has been described uh, in cases of congenital urethroceals uh, is a Chwala membrane, so C-H-W-A-L-L-A. -L -L -A. So Chwala membrane is a congenital membrane seen in the fetus uh, at the junction of the ureter and uh, uh, the bladder. If there is failure of resorption of this membrane, that can give rise to urethroceal. So remember that term, maybe in your exams, somebody may ask you or you may get an, uh, it as an MCQ option. So uh, either it can be due to that uh, or it can be due to an inflammatory stricture that closes the distal end of the ureter. So that's a simple urethroceal. In cases of ectopic uh, uh, urethroceal, uh, so what happens is that the lower end of the ureter uh, is, uh, opens up ectopically and because it's an ectopic location, uh, they are prone to having a urethroceal. And in these cases, uh, they are almost always associated with duplication of the ureters. And here is where your vagert mayer law will come into play. So make sure that you read about that. Uh, in exams, uh, you may be asked about that. Another interesting uh, variety of urethroceal, which I, uh, I was not aware and I uh, found when I, uh, when I was going through the literature, I came across it, is known as a seco urethroceal. So what happens is that in ectopic urethroceals, the, uh, the location of uh, the, the abnormality can be lower down. Uh, so usually the uretric opening is lower down. What can happen is that it, the urethroceal can prolapse all the way into the urethra, like a tongue-like projection. So cecum uh, is uh, used for a tongue-like projection. So even if you imagine the cecum as part of the bowel, it's a tongue-like projection. So that's, if you can remember it that way. So a seco urethroceal is a uh, prolapse of the urethroceal into the urethra. 
So that's another subtype. So rarely uh, you may come across that or maybe asked in the exams. Okay, moving to the final case, I just go to see if there are any questions so far. Okay, so our last case was hereditary hemorrhagic telangiectasias. Uh, there is a clinical uh, criteria for diagnosing hemorrhagic, hem uh, uh, hereditary hemorrhagic telangiectasias. Uh, Curaco, so I, I, I don't know how do I pronounce that, but it's C-U-R-A-C-A-O. So Curaco criteria are important for diagnosing hemorrhagic hem uh, hereditary hemorrhagic telangiectasias. Commonly the skin, lungs, and mucous membranes are involved. And on imaging, uh, see on, in the liver, you may get, uh, so there are multiple findings that have been described. Telangiectasias are tiny arterially hyperenhancing lesions. So less than 10 millimeter. When they are more than 10 millimeter, they are called as large confluent vascular masses. So these will show arterial enhancement, which will persist during the portal venous phase. The one which we saw, those were hepatic perfusion anomalies. So you'll see uh, a lot of enhancement in the arterial phase, which becomes iso to the liver parenchyma in the rest of the phages. So that is, those are hepatic perfusion anomalies. Compare these to say what we say in cirrhosis. In cirrhosis, those perfusion anomalies are typically uh, uh, peripheral and subcapsular. And you'll see that the nodule, you'll see the contour of the liver would be more nodular. So these are non-focal uh, perfusion anomalies. You can also get what are known as perfusion, focal perfusional anomalies. So if you see a wedge-shaped hyper-enhancing area uh, in the arterial phase that becomes iso in the portal phase, so that is commonly what we call as a THAD uh, or THID, uh, transient hepatic attenuation difference. So you can get that as well. And lastly, you can see arteriovenous, arteriopotal, uh, and portovenous shunts. So in the, those cases, you will see vascular findings. So that was uh, hereditary hemorrhagic telangiectasia in brief. And those were my cases. And I will now stop sharing and we'll move on to our next speaker. So our next speaker is Dr. Ankur Jajodia. Uh, he is a uh, consultant in the Department of Radiology at Rajiv Gandhi uh, Cancer Center. He is, uh, uh, he is a true academician. He likes to do a lot of research uh, and he always wants to uh, share and teach. Uh, and uh, uh, I have been in touch with him for the past few months and uh, uh, his, uh, his if you go and check his, uh, say, PubMed profile, he has tons of research and uh, he was, uh, I'm, I welcome him and I thank him for uh, uh, spending time with us today. Another important, uh, interesting fact about Ankush is that he wants to be, he is a wannabe chef. So maybe uh, uh, on one of our next uh, talks, we can have a special uh, lecture from Ankush uh, uh, describing his favorite dish. So uh, I will uh, now uh, request Ankush to start sharing his screen. Over to you, Ankush. Thank you, Dr. Amar, for the kind invitation. I hope I'm audible. Uh, yes, you are audible. So thank you everyone for being present today. Uh, uh, hi to the folks there on the Western side, a very good morning to all of you and to the people attending from my country, India. Uh, good evening to you. Thank you for being there, especially to the everyone and especially to the, all the residents and those who have made it in India. We all know that the second wave is going on and it's such difficult times. So if you have logged in or you are interested in these kind of academic activities, even in this under extenuating circumstances, uh, really hats off to you. And on that note, I would really uh, thank you, Amar, for inviting me to such a uh, prestigious platform. And uh, I hope to learn from you. So uh, just to uh, save my bandwidth, I would be uh, switching off my video. And I hope everyone can still see my slides. Uh, just uh, something on the chat or something like a hi that my slides are fine a thumbs up or a hi or anything. Okay, so I am currently affiliated as a consultant in Rajiv Gandhi Cancer Institute. It's been more than four years and I did a part of my training here. And on that note, I would like to show some of the cases. All these cases are during from my time of residency 
uh, till the time I, as an attending and then as a consultant i have uh, spent here and what i have learned from these cases how i have approached so uh, after each film like these cases what i have done is i have just uh, created a mcq format so four options uh, label 1 2 3 4 uh, please uh, feel free to in the chat section to just uh, comment whatever you feel is the most appropriate answer uh, one two three or four so with that uh, let's start with the baby steps and with the baby steps i mean this is a, a nine year female uh, who presented on with our emergency with the respiratory distress and obviously your radiograph was done and with that so what is the source of problem and i would really like you people to participate uh, and label it one, two, three, or four. So where is the source of the problem? I'll again show the X-ray. So is it the pulmonary tissue? Is it the pleura? Is it the chest wall or the abdomen? So I see in the chat section, a uh, lot of uh, people are going for the second option. So uh, approach to these uh, radiographs uh, has been already part of it, like which is the uh, lucent uh, hemithorax has been beautifully covered by one of the previous uh, speakers in this radiogram channel. And uh, my approach to this uh, would start by actually having uh, starting to look at the corners of the film and then coming gradually uh, to the center. It's a personalized approach and everyone should develop it, uh, people from the center to the far end of the film or from the far end of the film uh, to the center of the film. But in this, it is basically the uh, cause of a hemi opacification of the thorax. And I, this is where uh, the abnormality is there. And the trachea here, as you see, is pushed to the contralateral side. There is definitely a mediastinal shift. And uh, this mediastinal shift is basic, basically when uh, approaching these cases, you either see the trachea, whether it is pushed whether it is pulled or whether it is in central in the midline. And for each, you have a few differentials. In this case, it is pushed. So my differentials, the top differentials uh, would be definitely a pleural effusion, or diaphragmatic hernia uh, in a child, or maybe a large pulmonary mass, uh, something on the lines of a blastoma. And uh, if it was uh, pulled, then definitely there is some kind of volume loss. You think of a pneumonectomy, a pulmonary urgenesis given the age. And if the trachea lies central, then some causes are like ARDS, edema, mesothelioma, or some chest wall masses. So on that note, then uh, we definitely uh, recommended this uh, child for a, uh, uh, this is a chest wall mass. The source of the problem is basically in the chest wall when we recommended a CT. So this was a axial CT, the bone window. And this was showing a very aggressive kind of a periosteal reaction from on the lateral end of the ribs on the left side. And we can see that uh, uh, the, again, uh, there is a very uh, small tip I would like to just share during the course of all these lectures, small tips with you. So whenever the term aggressive uh, periosteal reaction is used, especially in pediatrics, we should be very, very careful because there are a lot of non-tumors like condition that may also uh, mimic this kind of aggressive appearance. So on that note, uh, this is an aggressive and this is the uh, contrast CT where we can see that there's a heterogeneously enhancing mass. And uh, after looking at these films, so what are the relevant differential diagnosis and what is the final differential diagnosis? So this is actually for the people who are going to give their MD examinations, DNB or the di diploma examinations here in India where you are expected at the end of the case to give your relevant. So the word is relevant top three differentials and always make it a point that you give it in the order that the first, second, third is first is the priority. Because if you, while explaining to the examiner, if you say that the second one, if you try to, you know, push the examiner towards the second, he will always ask you that, why did you put it in the second? Why not the first one? So, uh, okay, so the final diagnosis, I see a lot of evings, a lot of evings and yes, evings is the correct answer. Uh, there is a small link for a, a beautiful uh, uh, article on approach to pediatric uh, chest wall masses. And uh, these chest wall masses actually, uh, traditionally speaking, the mediastinal shift is absent, but this was one of those uh, cases where the mass was huge. And uh, due to some reason, the patient presented late. Also, I would want you people to notice uh, that in this particular, uh, I'll, my laser, just a second. 
so here you could see that the chest wall there is a there is a difference the axillary fat planes and the uh, wall muscle the subcutaneous tissue it was fine here but here if you would see that there is certainly a overlapping structure some kind of homogeneous opacity which is bulging in the chest wall and definitely it has displaced this axillary fat pad so always remember when you are presented with these kind of cases and especially also the peripheral uh, x ray radiographs so to always look at these places where you know you have uh the these kind of uh, you know fat pad shifting up, up here so this would like give a clue that this, in this case for me the examiner would have like tried to build on this particular clue that this would be a chest wall mass rather than a pleural mass so evings lot of you got it correct thank you and moving on to the next case so from pediatric let's uh, talk of the adult and this was a 40 year old male he presented with uh, shortness of breath and please have a good look at the radiograph and from there i would want uh, to ask the next question i hope you all had a good look at the radiograph so this is my question that where lies the accessory abnormality in this particular radiograph i would want to ask that so is it 1 2 3 4 you could type in the chat box so olga as you have correctly pointed bingo you have got my feelings on this one uh, selda meenu the accessory abnormality is in the apex and uh, yes because uh, the word why used was and highlighted was the accessory abnormality so these kind of questions since i am currently in rajiv gandhi i have seen uh my previous center also in goa medical college was a, a examination center for both md and dnb and uh, currently also in rajiv gandhi it's a center uh, for examination so gradually because of this pandemic they have moved to the oski pattern and in the oski pattern such kind of tricky words are there where the answer is always not obvious and you have to really correctly identify it, it really takes you back to one of those all india examinations this is about the i'm talking pertaining to the people uh, who are attending it from india who would understand so you have to catch those words in oski and really answer it correct so definitely your the basics have to be uh, visited which is felson and the examiner will not tolerate anything short of felson where this was the primary abnormality uh, i would say primary because just it is eye catching and this is very obvious and then again there was a, in this apex there was this abnormality so uh, the felson sign of selhout sign which is a must uh, which basically states that any two substances of same density in direct contact they cannot be differentiated from each other on an x ray and this phenomena basically which is the uh, uh, like loss of uh, normal radiograph selhout is called the selhout sign and it's very important to recognize and identify this sign and correctly identify the place try to locate the uh, anatomical uh, zone where this particular abnormality may be so here is we advise the patient for a subsequent ct and uh, these are heterogeneously enhancing masses both in the apex and as well as uh, in the left lower zone that was also obvious in the chest radiograph and based on this uh, i would want uh, any kind of differentials after looking at this so it is the option number 1 is mets from an rcc 2 is it a new case of neurofibromatosis 3 is it epithelioid hemangioendothelioma or 4 is it hydatid so if you want to look back again at the ct the ct is this and thank you for commenting in the chat section selda dr sharmin by the match so mets from rcc is an excellent thought and actually uh, working in a cancer care center we also uh, thought that that has to be in a 40 year male given the age and demographics it is very very important always to go with the age and uh, so mets from rcc was one of our top diagnosis but then neurofibromatosis epithelioid hemangioendothelioma and hydatid so we obviously there was no other option but to go for a bone needle biopsy and biopsy turned out uh, this entity turned out to be epithelioid hemangioendothelioma so basically this is just a pathological diagnosis and anyone would have been correct calling it a uh, mets from an rcc uh, why is it not neurofibromatosis uh, because 
neurofibromatosis uh, gives a plethora of uh, other manifestations and especially in the skeletal system there are some manifestation which is basically pseudo arthrosis of the joint but here typically when the chest wall is there the bony uh, ribs are there uh, you get something like as the ribbon shaped ribs you usually do not get these kind of destructive infiltrating soft tissue masses associated with uh, ribs at least in neurofibromatosis such kind of appearance can be there in neurofibromatosis i have seen i cannot deny and um, hydrated well you get all those signs the crew sign the serpent sign so uh, we leave it and epithelioid hemangiotelioma just for the sake of completion it's a rare vascular tumor so a rare diagnosis is always less preferred and uh, it is a it involves a multi system the lung liver and the bones and it's commonly oftenly misdiagnosed and this was a pitfall for us in the radiological department but obviously it's a cancer care institute tertiary cancer care institute and the final diagnosis is always pathological so again a link for those uh, ap approach after approach to these chest wall uh, you know multiple masses from a beautiful article from radiographics the link is there below and moving on to a third case so this is a 49 year old male and he presented with fatigue so i would want you folks to have a good look at a axial uh, ct scan of the abdomen and i am sorry i could not integrate my packs and have the whole video running there for you uh, uh, it is a bit uh, due to technical issues i uh, couldn't have this time for the next time i would try to do that so this is a obvious abnormality i hope all you folks have picked it up and um, further a section down uh, just because i was section uh, showing this at the aorta so a section down where just the aorta has bifurcated again a very homogeneously uh, enhancing mass with attenuation similar to that of this psoas muscle and um, yes so uh, uh, as uh, the basic question would be that only so what is the organ of origin and what exactly wh where lies the mass you know that is how the approach so my effort today is just to build the basic approach i'm trying to show in each cases so where would you place this mass uh, uh, is would you place this mass in the retroperitoneal or as mesentery so could you just uh, type that in the chat section that is it a retroperitoneal mass or is it a mass in the mesentery how would you start uh, presenting this case uh, to the examiner or while reporting okay so all of you have got it correct mesentery so now whatever you had made up so this happens during the examination so uh, at all levels be it at md dnb or even the boards and the frcr like uh, i have not answered the frcr finals i have just answered part of it but uh, a lot of friends and uh, colleagues they have answered the final so this is the same patient at the same time at the same time this is a section of the ct scan uh, uh, in the uh, lung window and uh, these are some abnormalities i have just highlighted you uh, for some so after having a look at that uh, uh, you got it right that that was a mesenteric origin mass that was something abnormal and a plus b now do would you think you could uh, arrive at a differential diagnosis so one whether i would think it is a hypervascular mets from rcc uh, whether is it a gist whether i would go for a mesenteric mass carcinoid as some of you were already typing in the chat box section i observed or whether would you would go for a nodal mass so yes when a mesenteric uh, enhancing mass in the mesentery is presented the one of the most common cases that we have seen and we have always uh, uh, you know we, we are more inclined to call it a carcinoid but uh, faisal ic has uh, opted for a lymph nodal mass and uh, i oh, i just want i am missing the uh, interaction with faisal that uh, why uh, was a lymph nodal mass considered so actually this was a lymph nodal mass and the whole uh, point in this case was this is basically when i gave the first clue that a 14 year year nine male with fatigue so he turned out to be a chronic uh, lymphocytic leukemia patient and because in this leukemias and lymphoma especially in lymphoma uh, leukemias they have this uh, counts are less and this was just uh, uh, the patient was having an incidental fungal infection 
So this proved as fungal, both on serum and uh, basically lab mar markers, galactomannan, and uh, all those cultures. And this was a nodal mass from his uh, chronic lymphocytic leukemia. There were other nodes elsewhere. And after taking the chemo, then the follow-up CT, this uh, lesion was completely uh, absent. It, uh, it, it just showed almost a complete response. So this was a case of CLL with the uh, carcinoid would have presented with one of the classical radiological signs of angulation, tethering, you know, bowel. The, the whole fat plane around this mass is so beautiful and so clean. So uh, carcinoids usually this uh, tend to have this desmoplastic reactions. So for me, in a cancer institute, if such a mass is coming and if it's a female, I would be very, very uh, 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 likely to call it even uh, incidental mets in the mesentery from a breast and I would want to have a look at the breast. But since this was a male, so apart from that, yes, I would think carcinoid, but if the angulation, tethering and those signs would be there, so I would want to uh, go with carcinoid in that case. Uh, and... Um, Moving on to the next case. So this was a 45 year old male with uh, abdominal distension. And these are the sequential uh, non-contrast and the contrast scans that uh, were done. And again, sorry for not having it at a video format, but uh, this is uh, what I could pull up together. So please have a look at it. The same, uh, at the same time, after having a look at this, this was the chest sections, the lung windows and so as few of you have uh, already started typing the omental cake, so that is why I presented this uh, next uh, on the same, uh, same day at the same time, we also ordered a chest CT and at the same time we did a chest CT and uh, Faisal, would you want to correct the omental cake now? But by looking at this, uh, would you want to retract it? And is there something else you can think of? Again, like add up A plus B, you arrive at a particular differential diagnosis or something. So my list of differential diagnosis for this would be, would I call it a mesothelioma or a peritoneal carcinomatosis or the third, a leomyomatosis peritoneal disseminata or tuberculosis? So I'll just repeat uh, the options. One, mesothelioma. Two, peritoneal carcinomatosis. Three, leomyomatosis peritonealis disseminata. And four, tuberculosis. So this was the chest section once again. And this was the CT scan section. So in the chat box, as I can say, most of you have opted for TB. Uh, for the Western world, uh, uh, I wouldn't say. But for th those in India who are calling this TB, you are not at all doing a wrong job. TB is actually rampant and predominant and the various manifestations of TB, uh, e even till date, my professor used to uh, uh, still says and uh, uh, like TB can come in any way, in any form. So the more you see, the more you are always amazed by TB, lymphoma and hydrated. For, from an Indian population point of view, these three I am always amazed at. So this was actually a case of mesothelioma. So why I would uh, not want to call it a tuberculosis, probably this uh, uh, was uh, most of you guys were very correct in looking at these fibrocalcific or, you know, reticulations and especially involving the apex where the primary insult occurs, the GONS focus and uh, the mycobacterium avium as they survive at these regions and to call this TB, but tuberculosis, if we go in the mechanism, it's more of the, those caseous necrosis, those nodes are there, which ultimately, uh, you know, they cause a spill and that micro spillage is then uh, distributed throughout the peritoneal. And there are three various manifestations of tuberculosis. It is the dry type, the wet type and the mixed type. So uh, usually tuberculosis will have, you know, areas of necrosis and more of, you know, necrotic nodes, uh, even if in the mesentery region. Having retroperitoneal nodes in TB is a rare thing. And please remember that while uh, if you are presented with a retroperitoneal node, please think twice before calling it a TB. But if in the mesentery and the other regions, if you are seeing necrotic nodes, caseous necrosis, then please call it a TB. As for this, this is basically when a mesothelioma happens, they uh, tend to form, you know, focal sheet like nodular thickening along the whole of the peritoneum, which is very visible on this 
uh, left lumbar region and there even can be these focal masses arising which i have uh, pointed out here so these focal masses and uh, uh, as uh, amaya has said the uh, great mimickers tb and lymphoma uh, this, this was our actually a uh, case and where we could uh, just not uh, go without a biopsy and after the biopsy we saw that this was a case of mesothelioma interestingly to for the sake of completion what i have seen in this center that if the patient presents late with mesothelioma uh, the peritoneal mesothelioma through this diaphragm actually they can spread even to the lung pleura so if the patient will presenting there will be a widespread picture of mesothelioma both involving the pleural surfaces the thorax also and the abdomen also in which case it would be very very difficult to actually uh, locate that where the mesothelioma had actually first started whether it had started in the lung and it penetrated the diaphragm and dropped down or whether it climbed up through the diaphragm and it was there in the thorax so that should be kept in the back of the mind if the patient presents late and uh, but this was a tuberculosis uh, incidental tuberculosis in this patient with mesothelioma so moving on to the next uh, and my last case for today so this was a, a 40 year male and uh, uh, he presented with uh, some kind of uh, headache and um, to the uh, usual uh, routine outside to his general physician who then ordered an uh, mr uh, imaging and with that mr imaging after looking at it uh, uh, it he was referred to our uh, uh, center and these are the axial uh, t2 uh, sequences this is a post contrast sequence and uh, we see that there is a mass here few more things i just want to highlight with the arrows before i pose my questions so few other sequences uh, namely this is basically the t1 sequence this is the flare sequence and this is the gradient sequences at the same sections of the same patient and if you would want to approach this so to the approach the first question goes definitely the definitive sign for the approach to diagnosing such lesions in the brain so one is for the broad base towards the dura the definitive sign bony hyperosteosis or it is a cleft sign or is it a cortical buckling so 1 2 3 4 uh, please folks participate in the chat comment box so as olga and selda and saithi rachna neha you have uh, uh, meenu you have correctly pointed out that the definitive sign for approach to diagnosis is absolutely hands down the cleft sign so when such a case is poised at you the, again it is the first again basics you start like approaching where is the mass is the mass interaxial or extraaxial so you have to always start from there and there are definitely some signs which are mentioned which are a clue which suggest that the mass is extraaxial but then there is a list of signs that are definitive that the mass is definitely extraaxial so for these options the broad base towards the dura the bony hyperosteosis these two signs suggest that the mass may be extraaxial but they are not definitive sign cleft sign which is basically a visualization of the csf cleft on the t2 sequences that is considered definitive sign cortical buckling is the one on the option and this in this arrow i have highlighted as i said while providing the history that the mr was done outside and due to some reason this wasn't uh, i could not show you guys the cleft sign ideally which is a mistake on my part but i did not have the cleft sign the reason for not having the cleft sign even i wondered uh, while reporting this and uh, it led me to believe that cleft sign is definitive but you can only able to catch it if your sections are thin enough to exactly locate where the cleft was there if your sections are thicker which is as is in this case probably the mr has been done in 5 mm or maybe even higher uh, thicker sections so the some cleft sign has been missed here so this is what the arrow is pointing out at the cortical buckling sign which is basically an extraaxial mass that will cause some kind of buckling to the inner white matter in this t2 images 
the outer gray matter is the cortex so this white matter would be definitely buckled and pushed inside if it would have been an interaxial mass then that would have been a destruction of the cortical white matter instead of pushing this buckling white matter so that is a very important sign for again localizing between so all in these three sequences you can definitely see this white matter which is heaped up and uh, which is just at the advancing edge of the lesion and it is it, it was uh, these are some other sagittal sequences t2 and again post contrast where again you see a very very broad base towards the dura again i have been, not been able to show the cleft sign probably i did not get it within the uh, acquisition uh, range and so again the differential as i have been seeing that lot of you have been voraciously posting in the chat comment box uh, av malformations oligodendroglioma so oligodendroglioma would have been their sr if it would have been i would have called in uh, intraaxial mass but this is an extraaxial mass and focal cortical based mass with calcification so yes definitely oligodendroglioma uh, is a top differential diagnosis but since i have already given my way and this is an extraaxial lesion we have located it so would i want to call it a a hemangiopericytoma two a meningioma three a mex or four a glyosarcoma so a lot of you are in favor of a hemangiopericytoma which is probably because you guys noticed that the t2 uh, appearance of this lesion was quite high point and so apart from the approach basic approach that this lesion was intra or extraaxial the second uh, fascinating thing about this case i would point out here is this appearance on t2 which for which i have uh, then uh, given this t1 which again you see that there is kind of a white and then yes and please do not confuse it for that salt and pepper sign which you get in glomus uh, tumors and th this suddenly this obviously is not a location for one of those glomus tumors and there is th this uh, blooming like borash is blooming on the gradient sequences and uh, we had to ultimately uh, see for the other uh, signs in this patient and uh, it turned out to be a metastasis dural base mex so uh, radiology our department we, we were taken back and hemangiopericytoma could have been considered but between hemangiopericytoma and meningioma i would rank hemangiopericytoma up if i see a more kind of uh, um, aggressive uh, bony invasion and a more uh, aggressive enhancement meningiomas on the other hand have been classically defined because of the lack of blood brain barrier as any kind uh, it's smooth homogeneously enhancing mass so this would not be a typical pattern of the enhancement of a meningioma so uh, there was something definitely else going on which uh, kept us on our toes and gliosarcoma is also a very rare but we have seen cases uh, i could be uh, showing them subsequently and we ordered a subsequent systemic examination thorough uh, pet ct and this was what we found on the pet ct that there was a bad uh, potential metabolically hyperactive left hilar mass for those of you who are not uh, acquainted that seeing pet ct scans is absolutely fine i would just request you to consider this uh, lightened up area of hyper orange near the uh, pulmonary uh, artery and consider this as a left hilar mass and basically it is 18 fdg there was also an ipsilateral malignant pleural effusion so this turned out to be basically a, a adenocarcinoma of the lung of the papillary variant and because adenocarcinomas of the gi tract and lung they have been classically also uh, known to show this kind of a t2 hypointense uh, appearance on uh, in the brain lesions and this heterogeneous enhancement coupled with this cortical buckl buckling sign should help us to localize this as an extraaxial lesion and the absence of a smooth uh, enhancement along with not a voracious invasion of the bone would make mostly meningiomas and hemangiopericytoma less likely so this was also the ct image where a contrast ct and this was the mass on the ct and it was also having a uptake on the pet ct and it was treated as a case of ca lung with brain nets and this is a suggested reading for uh, further t2 because most of the time uh, in india at least you get a question so approach to t2 hyper intense lesions on the brain where you have all those favorite uh, names uh, things eye of the tiger uh, and all those things but there is a also a t2 hypo intense so whenever possible please go through this link and thank you that would be from my end. 
you, Ankush. Uh, those were amazing cases. And uh, not only that, I liked how you discuss the approach towards these cases. So even though um, in exams, you may or may not be able to get the correct single diagnosis, but having that correct approach will definitely get you close uh, uh, to the, like you'll get the, in most cases, the examiners are not as brutal. And even if you get uh, the approach right, say for example, you're talking about an extra axial lesion in the last case, even if you come to that and talk about differentials, I think uh, most examiners would be happy to give you most of the marks. So uh, those were great cases. And I loved uh, uh, the way you approached uh, each of those cases. So thank you everyone for joining us today and make sure you hit the thank like you. button. Um, uh, that helps the video reach more people. And even you will get more uh, such radiology vid videos in your YouTube suggestions. So it's kind of a win-win situation. And if you're new here, subscribe to the channel and get uh, notifications so that whenever, you have, whenever, whenever we are live next time, uh, you'll get an update. And uh, so thank you guys. And uh, we, we shall see you in our next talk. Bye-bye.